Good morning, everybody. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Beautiful sunset on the Pacific Ocean Thursday night. And Captain Joe looked out with great pleasure on the uh, surroundings. He had just had a chance to throw out the chain log and uh, was able to record in his journal that night that they were steaming along at 13 knots. This is pretty impressive for 1858 because most people do not go 13 knots at this time. Captain Joe went to sleep and he was very contented. He was en route from San Francisco to Boston from the west coast of the United States uh, to the east coast. But unfortunately, uh, in those days, they had, did not have yet the uh, Panama Canal. So he was taking the route around Cape Horn to get there. As he drifted off to sleep, there was not too much uh, troubling him, but something grasped him. Maybe it was a dream. Maybe it was a voice he could hear, but he was deeply troubled. Breakers under lee, breakers under lee. That's a code word for mariners. <laughs> it means that all is not well when you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The lookout on top could see that there were uh, bra waves breaking over some rocks ahead, and this should not be because they were in the middle of the ocean. It was one o'clock now in the morning, and it was pretty dark. Captain Joe hurried out onto deck and he found himself with a terrible picture in front of him. He turned as hard as he could to avoid these rocks, but unfortunately, as uh, sometimes is the case, when you have that much speed and 1,500 tons of momentum behind you, he was not able to make that turn. And within just a matter of moments, a massive grinding sound as the boat was rammed against the reef. Pretty soon the whole world was crashing around their ears. Literally, the spars came tumbling down from the masthead. The boat hull had been strengthened with sheets of brass and these were being thrown up at the same time as the spars were coming down. He told his passengers and crew, get cover, seek shelter. This deck is not a safe place to be. And then he began to wonder, will this boat be carried off the rocks and into oblivion, or are we going to be smashed to pieces? He saw his life flash before his eyes, and he knew he was in terrible trouble. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are God of the universe. We thank you that you care about us when we are on the great perils of the ocean. And I pray that as we navigate a shipwreck this morning, that you would bring us close to your heart, that you would give us shelter in the time of storm, and that you'd bring us safely into your presence for our encouragement and for the sake of those around us, that we can encourage them too. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I encourage you to open them. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, a couple of very uh, central passages this morning. The first passage I'd like to look at, I'll just check my clicker here. Just bear with me, I'm a bit slow. Did I turn it on? It is on. I'm looking for the boat picture. Our passage this morning is going to be coming first off from Romans chapter 7. This is the place where our dear friend Paul is no stranger to shipwrecks. The passage in Romans 7 this morning is not a physical shipwreck. We'll get back to the physical shipwreck but we're going to have a look at Paul's 
um, psychological or emotional or spiritual shipwreck, if you like, and then we'll come back to it. In Romans chapter 7, this is in verses uh, 9 to 12. I'll see if I can get this clicker going for us. I think it will go. Yes, there we go. If you're able to read with me this morning, let's just um, follow along here. Romans chapter 7, verses 9, and we're going to go on past verse 12. So there'll be a few more slides coming along here. And I'll just uh, get my Bible sorted out as well. Romans chapter 7. starting at verse 9. My wife's got a brand new Bible for me, so I'm just figuring out how the pages turn. Thanks for being patient with me. Romans chapter 7, verses 9. This is Paul speaking. He says this, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. We continue on. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. There should be one more. Skipping down to verse 19 and verse 20. Paul is now in a big struggle for his life. Let's see if this makes sense. I can relate to this struggle. He says this, For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin who dwells within me. And in verse 24, he laments, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now, it might seem a bit strange to you that Paul is saying all this because Paul is a religious person, right? Paul grew up as a good boy. He knew all of the religious things. He was a religious leader. But when he came across Jesus Christ and he learned the law for real, that's when he determined that he was having a shipwreck. Now that he'd found Jesus, even though he had known all of his life, all of these details, now for the first time he was admitting, he was recognizing a big struggle within him. These are the things that I want to do But in real life, these are the things that I'm actually doing. How on earth can I do the right things? I know what they're supposed to be. I just don't do them. I don't want to. I I just, my nature is against me. I'm struggling for my life. I'm in a hopeless situation. As the sun rose the next morning, it's now Friday morning, Captain Joe is now for the first time able to survey the wreckage. He's able to see, at least in part, what has come of his ship. Unfortunately, his ship has been impaled. It is taking on water. Thankfully, it has been driven up onto the rock more steadfast and it has not yet broken apart. So he decides we need to quickly figure out how we can get to safety. As he looks off the ship to the, um, to the rest of the breakers, he finds there's a strand of yellow sand. And so he asks his, his um, first officer, 
and some men to hop into a rowboat and paddle out to see what kind of a island they might have come across. Is this island favourable? There have been rumours of cannibals in this area and they wanted to make sure that this would hopefully not be one of those islands. And uh, so the first officer went and surveyed, they took a shovel, they were able to dig for a little bit because their first priority was water. We got to have water to drink and they found some water, it was a bit brackish, not very nice to drink, but they determined that it would be suitable uh, for human consumption. So they came back to the ship and began to unload their goods. They had about uh, 25 kilograms of gold, which at that time was worth about $18,000. My best estimates today is about $8.5 million worth of gold they had on board the ship. Plus they had some passengers and some other supplies. They brought what they could across to the island. Captain Joe also asked his officers if they would um, build some tents out of the sails and use that as a form of shelter for the about 40 or so people that were now marooned on this little island. As he checked his charts, he found out that the map, the map did have this little atoll on it, but somebody had misplaced this island about 20 miles off where it actually was. And so Captain Joe's thinking, that's a bit unfair that they put this island in the wrong spot. That's why we ran into it last night, but it doesn't really help us out very much now. For the next week, they thought, how are we going to do this? There were rats and crabs keeping them awake at night. It was pretty wind swept, and they didn't have very much in the way of provisions. What they got off the ship um, was inadequate, and they weren't able to get everything off the ship because of the storm. As time progressed, it was clear to Joe that they were not going to be rescued, and so his only hope was to sail to an inhabited uh, locale and raise an alarm for rescue. So that's what he did. He got some men together, and uh, a group of about seven of them got into a boat, and they, they uh, got ready to sail off to the nearest inhabitable island. All he could think about, all he could do to keep himself going was to think about his family. He'd have dreams every night about his wife and his children back home in Boston. I wonder how my wife and children are going. When my boat doesn't arrive as it's supposed to in a few weeks' time, how's my family going to cope with the grief of my assumed loss? They don't know that I've survived. How am I going to tell them? He, he decided, I need to be confident. I need to focus on my family. I've got to keep my family in my mind and somehow get my crew and my passengers through this. They sailed to the nearest inhabited island, 100 miles away. It took quite an effort to get there. When they got to the island, the water was so rough that they had to spend all night rowing just to keep within sight of the island. And the next morning, they were able to land. They went up to the settlement where the people supposedly were and found that the island was now deserted. They were quite discouraged. But they thought, we'll set up some smoke signals, we'll set up a watch, and we'll try and attract some attention. Surely some ship will come past and we'll get some help. Or, if necessary, we'll sail off to the next inhabited island and try and raise an alarm. Unfortunately, though, about four or five days later, one of their lookouts called out to Joe, Hey, Joe, our boat is adrift. The boat they'd sailed to their island had been washed out to sea, and before their very eyes, they saw this boat get destroyed as it was thrown against some rocks, and it was not salvageable. The boat was not uh, repairable. It was just splinters and uh, sails. So now we've got Joe's main crew on an island 100 miles away. He's now on this supposedly inhabited island, which is deserted, and he's lost his only boat. And now he's really struggling and really thinking, how on earth do I get out of this? All he could think about was his family. And I'll try and sneak on now to... 
a little promise in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Let's see if I can get this one to come up. Here we go, Matthew chapter 6. This is our key passage for today, and it'll make sense in just a few moments. Matthew chapter 6 has a promise for us when we are facing some big difficulties. I don't know what you've been through the last few weeks and months. I haven't got time to share my story with you today, but I've been through a real, very difficult time of my life the last 18 months. It's been devastating. Matthew chapter 6. For those of you that are pretty cluey and have smartphones or whatever, if you want to put two columns at once, there's a parallel passage in Luke 12. Or if you like to flip pages, Luke 12, uh, 22 to 31, is a parallel passage of Matthew chapter 6. I'll just be in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 33. A whole bunch of stuff there, but in particular, let's have a look at verse 33. I know you've seen this a thousand times before, but look at it very carefully because there's something special in here that you may not have noticed before. It says this, but seek first, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. What things is Mark talking about here? Well, from verse 25 onwards, there's a whole list of different concerns that we have about life. And at the end of this passage, Mark say, sorry, Matthew says, but having just discussed all of those things, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things can be assured. This is not a prosperity gospel sermon, by the way. This is just a promise that God is with us. I want to just uh, briefly share with you the importance of focusing on the important thing. I've been a pilot for the Royal Flying Doctor Service for 10 years until last March when my world fell apart. I got sick and I lost my medical, so I can't fly anymore. But for the last 10 years, I was given the privilege of helping people in very difficult situations. Like Captain Joe, I would regularly get woken at one o'clock in the morning, except in my case, rather than being told about breakers under Lee, I'd get a phone call saying code one to Kubapiti or somewhere um, in the South Australian outback. And as we would take off to go for our flights, it was pretty typical for the weather to be uh, not so favourable, or at the very least, being pitch black, no reference point. I don't know if there are other pilots in the room today, but attitude instrument flying is absolutely critical. It is the first priority every pilot knows they must focus on. When you're flying the aeroplane, the first thing you must do is fly the aeroplane. The radios can wait, the navigation stuff is secondary, uh, anything else to do with aircraft systems, they're important as well. But the first step, the first priority, is to fly the aeroplane. Oh, just, sorry, just a sec. You can see the one on the right there. So at the top of that uh, picture, you see a little artificial horizon. If I can get the, maybe I can't get the laser to go either. There it is. That's the artificial horizon. That's the attitude indicator. That is the first reference point for the whole flight. Do you think? once I've had a good look at that at the beginning of the flight, that I can now relax and focus on everything else and ignore that for the rest of the flight. Is that good airmanship, do you think? Obviously not. So seeking first the attitude indicator doesn't just happen prior to takeoff, as important as that point is, but it happens throughout the flight. In fact, every four or five seconds, maybe 10 if I'm brave, I'm back at the attitude indicator. I ignore that at my peril. And I'm just wondering this morning, as Paul is telling us, sorry, as Matthew is telling us to help Paul out, seek first the kingdom of God. It doesn't just mean check it out as part of your pre flight inspection or as part of your takeoff um, uh, instrumentation check, but you also want to be thinking about the kingdom of God throughout your flight. In fact, you don't want to stop thinking about it until the aeroplane is tied down and the engine is shut off. Otherwise, we know what happens. 
But there's another promise that is going to help us out with this Matthew 6 concept of seeking first the kingdom of God. And that is, there's the little indicator for where the attitude indicator is. Let's so get up to the next slide. This is a beautiful promise that I have gotten so much courage out of. This is Psalms 37. And these are our two promise passages today. So if you want to keep yourself orientated in Matthew chapter 6 and then sneak over to Psalms 37. There's something similar here that might remind you of what we just saw in uh, Matthew chapter 6. This is Psalms 37 verses 3, and we'll go up to verse uh, 7 from memory. This is what it says, Psalms 37 verse 3, Trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land, befriend faithfulness. Here's my favourite verse, verse 4, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Notice what happens first and what happens second. Commit your way to the Lord, verse 5. Trust in him and he will act. If I can get to the next, there it is, verse 6 and 7. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way. So there's a sequence here, there's a priority. There's something that happens first and something that happens second. And we tend to get confused and flip it. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Back to poor Captain Joe. Captain Joe is marooned on the supposedly inhabited island. And there are some abandoned homes there, but he has now lost his boat. What is he to do now? And so he does what any intelligent captain would do. He decides to make an inventory of what they've got. What have we got here? Well, we've got some abandoned houses. They went through a shed and found some old axes. And they also found a keg of dried up gunpowder. And they thought, We've got to find some way of either raising an alarm here if a boat goes sailing past, or we need to make a new boat from scratch, without plans and with no tools other than some axes. They didn't have saws or pliers or hammers or wedges or pulleys, um, sandpaper, nothing like that, just some axes. They decided to go to work and at least that would pass the time while waiting for hopefully a, a rescue ship to come along. Over the course of several weeks, I think it ended up being about two or three months, they built themselves a little boat, they, they called it a little schooner, and they noted with a bit of frustration that the wood that they were using was, was green wood. So what happens when it dries? It, it shrinks. So the nice woodwork planking to get the boat to be watertight as the boat began to dry out, nice ventilation cracks began to appear between the timbers. So they, of course, tried to make, get some vines and some um, paste to make a bit of a, um, I guess you call it like a bit of a, a thatch or a bit of a sealant to fill the, go fill the gaps. And they had to do that twice because the first time the gaps just opened up again as the boat continued to dry out. Now they're getting ready to launch the boat. They, they, they found an abandoned church. It had a rostrum like this and a bit of an ensign on the front. They decided to adopt that as the flag for their new uh, boat. They christened it with a name that you might recognize. And then they put it into the water. Now, mariners can be a superstitious sort. And as these men put the boat into the water, they um, ran into a bit of trouble. The island they were on is known for quite treacherous seas. And they managed to, to jam the boat into the coral a couple of times and puncture a hole in the boat. And that, for, for a mariner's perspective, is, 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 is a bad omen. It's a bit superstitious. I'm not advocating that today. I'm just telling you a story. As this happened, three of the seven men decided, we're not going to go in this boat. We're staying here on this island until the end of time. And Captain Joe thought, well, 
that might be a good idea because the boat is small, less provisions, less people fighting on a small boat. You guys stay here, look after the place, and we'll go on. So they did. And they, they were able to hop into a boat and they figured out that the nearest, next nearest inhabitable island was about 1,500 miles away. This is still 1858. So it was, not, um, it was not plain sailing. But to cut a long story short, because our time's running away, they did make it to a particular island and they found an American warship. These guys were Americans and they were able to raise the alarm and get rescued. Their rescue was assured, but it was not complete. Why wasn't the rescue complete yet? We've still got two other islands worth of marooned people to take care of. That's right. We'll come back to that. Let's just sneak back to Paul for a minute. Remember Paul struggling with the two natures, Romans chapter 7? Does that ring a bell at all? Let's just see if I can get the pictures, the words on the screen there. Here we go. Romans chapter 7, verse 19 and 20. This is Paul. We just read this a few moments ago. Paul is lamenting here. I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the, sw but the sin that dwells in me, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? This is Paul's lamentation. How can we help Paul out today? Does anybody else struggle with this, or is it just me and Paul? Me and Paul, we struggle with this. We need some good news this morning. What is the good news for us? Well, according to Matthew chapter 6 and Psalm 37, and I think if you were to read through the Bible, there's a whole bunch of other passages that have this kind of idea in mind. But it seems to be that what God is hoping is that we will seek him in his ways first, and then God says, trust me, I will take care of you. See those birds, in the feet, those birds that fly around? They work hard, but really at the end of the day, it's the Heavenly Father that looks after these birds. Look at those flowers in the field. They don't go to the shops and buy fancy clothes, but have you ever seen anything dressed as well? Not even King Solomon in his splendor can match these flowers that I, God, have, have dressed the field with. God says, trust me first and I'll take care of you. I will look after the details. But we humans, we struggle with that, don't we? I don't know if this is going to animate or not, but sometimes those boxes tend to flip places a bit like this. Sometimes in our society, in our media, on TV, on the internet, at school, at work, everything is telling us, take care of number one first. Just this one little detail, just, just pay this bill, just go and check this detail out, just work this out now, and we'll sneak God in later. I've just got to do a quick little this and that, and then I'll jump into the God stuff when, when the time is right. And I'll just share one quick personal story with you. One morning, my wife and I were trying to organize some tickets for a travel overseas, and we'd had some difficulty with the reservation, so I thought, I'll just quickly call reservations, and I'll get this sorted out, and then I'll have my private devotional with the Lord. I, it'll just be a quick phone call, right? Just like five, ten minutes, and then I'll be all sorted. This happened about eight o'clock in the morning, and about one o'clock in the afternoon, having spent the entire morning on this, it got really complicated and, and involved and filled with trouble. It took me about five hours to sort this reservation out, and then when it came time to read my Bible, I just, I felt exhausted. <laughs> I felt frustrated and tired, and I thought to myself, I wonder what would have happened if I'd put God first this morning. I wonder what would have happened if I'd just had a bit more trust and, I don't know if these can come back. I'm gonna try and flip those um, back the way they should, the two little uh, speech boxes. Imagine what would happen if I put God first in the morning and then ask God to help me take care of whatever he thought was important. Maybe even the reservation. Maybe God can take care of that one. Yeah. But it isn't just me that struggles with this. If you look at the Bible, just briefly a survey of some stories, 
can you think of anybody else in the Bible who kind of thought, I'll just take care of my business first, and then God will take care of things later? People that put, put things ahead of God, perhaps. How about um, Samson? He, he talks to his parents and says, well, the parents question him, isn't, isn't there someone else that you can marry? And Samson says, actually, get her for me. She pleases me well. Or Jacob and Rebekah. Uh, there'd been a promise of a birthright for Jacob. And so Rebecca gets together and schemes and says, well, God hasn't quite worked it out yet. How about we just help God along a bit and just sort this little detail out? Or how about Abraham and Hagar? We'll just help God along. He's a bit slow, you know. I'm not sure if God can work this out, so I'll do, I'll do my own thing first, and then I'll um, check out with God and see how he's thinking about this. You know, there's one story in the Bible that encourages me, and that's, remember King David before he was king? He was running around through the countryside, running for his life, trying to get away from Saul, the, uh, the uh, first king of Israel. And multiple opportunities presented themselves. David could have gotten the dagger or the spear and, and sorted out his arch rival right there as he was sleeping or as he was relieving himself. And in fact, David's uh, associate said, here we go, this is a chance, God has put him into your hands, why don't you just go ahead and kill the guy and be done with it? God, you already know that God has ordained you to be king. And David says, how can I do this against the Lord's anointed? David, probably more than most of us, saw, at times in his life at least, the importance of trusting God first and then letting God work out the details. How does this play into our everyday life today? How are we going to sort this out? I'll just share maybe just about one minute worth of uh, research I've been doing on something called a pleasure trap. A pleasure trap is a term that's been made up by a couple of um, uh, researchers. One of them is a behavioral psychologist. He's an atheist, um, evolutionary perspective. But he's found in his research that in the animal world, and in his mind, in the human world as well, he ends up commenting about um, lifestyle and health. He finds that when we put pleasure first, when we seek what we, what we think is yummy for us first, we end up in an a addictive cycle that is self-destructive. And we know it's wrong, we know it's bad for us, we know that, in his, for example, in his case, we know, that, we know that certain types of junk food is bad for us, but we get so caught up in it that our entire um, psychology is screaming out and telling us, do it, do it, do it, as if we are being pushed against our will. And these, these secular scientists say, there's a solution to this pleasure trap, and the solution is to focus on that which is good, to focus on that which is healthy for us, not that which is yummy for us. And that's exactly what Matthew 6 and Psalm 37 says, we know what's good for us. It's the kingdom of God, God and his righteousness. We know that's what we need. If we seek that first, is it any surprise that God can take care of the other details in our life? Maybe, maybe you are a mum or a homemaker or a stay-at-home dad, as I've been for a bit, and you're kind of wondering to yourself, what does it look like in my role to seek first the kingdom of God? How can I do that when I'm at home with the dishes piling up or the laundry or the washing machines broken, in my case? What, what are some suggestions here? How can we seek God first if we're in a, in a position like this? We haven't got a whole congregation to preach to, but we've got some important pressing things in our home. What does it look like to put God first in that environment, I wonder? Well, in my case, and I don't always get it right, but I found it's really helpful to get up in the morning and the first possible thing that I can do, I know the kids are screaming and yelling, <laughs> try, and, try and find some time right at the beginning of the day and say, God, I want to be with you today. I want you to be king of my life. I want you to guide my decisions. And as I go today to do my laundry, to do my kitchen, to do my whatever it is, help me to figure out what's really important in relation to the kingdom of God. And please help me, Lord, with the rest of it. What if you are somebody else? What if you are a young person? Maybe you're a, a child or maybe you're a student. I think our children may have left us. Um, 
How do, we, how do we put God first in a classroom environment? I think there are some teachers here. How do we put God first in the classroom? If we are supposedly there to teach information, what does it look like to put God first? What if we are working in some sort of industry or maybe we're working in some kind of an office with other colleagues, solving problems or meeting KPIs? Maybe we are trying to fix things or engineer things or design things. How do we, what does it look like in that context to put the kingdom of God first? What if we are retired? We say, well, I've finished now. I've, I've crossed the finish line. I fought the good fight, like Paul says. How do I, and get, the, get the next slide up. The, um, here we go. How do I, what does it look like to put God first if I'm a retiree? What, is, what does that look like? What are your thoughts about that? How can we put God first? What does it mean to put God first if I don't officially have an employer um, that gives me money anymore? <laughs> or what if, I, if I'm in civil service? These are questions to think about. I just want to, in closing, share with you the significance of the story of Captain Joe. Captain Joe had a more extended name his name was Captain Josiah Knowles, and the island he was marooned on was, depending upon where you come from, the locals call it Oeno Island, hundreds miles from what we now know as Pitcairn Island, the abandoned island. Fourteen years after this amazing rescue, the, the other guys were rescued from the islands as well. Um, o, um, Oeno and Pitcairn, all of those were rescued, brought home. One of them did pass away before they were rescued, but the others all survived. And 14 years later, two people that are well known to some of you, um, a, a minister by the name of James White and another minister by the name of John Loughborough, went to meet with Captain Josiah Knowles and said, Sir, we've heard that you're going back to Pitcairn Island. And he said, that is correct. By this time, Josiah Knowles was a world famous captain. He has to this very day the fastest sailing time from San Francisco to Boston, going around Cape Horn. To this day, I think the record still stands. James White and John Loughborough said, could you please take a box of books and materials for us to the people of Pitcairn Island. And J Captain Josiah Knowles did that. His first visit since the shipwreck, he went back and he dropped these books off. They were not initially opened. They were, they were dropped off in about 1875 or six, I think from memory, somewhere in there. But it was 10 years later, after James White had passed away, before that box was opened. And as a result of that uh, shipwreck, that entire island gave their hearts to Jesus Christ and said that they would like to learn more about the three angels' messages. Maybe you're in a shipwreck today. Maybe you've had a pretty terrible last few months like myself. Maybe your life has fallen apart. I'll try and get the last slide here. But there is a promise here, and I would like to remind us of what we just saw in Matthew 6, and also in Psalms 37. Let's put God first. And this is what um, the writer of Deuteronomy says. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. This is what he thinks is the way to put God first. And with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be frontlets. Um, there shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I guess my question to you in closing today is, do you want to put Jesus first? Maybe you've already done it but you want to renew that commitment. Maybe you haven't done it recently, it hasn't been convenient, or things have fallen apart. Maybe I can't trust God because the storm has been too great. I'd like to encourage you to put Jesus first. Put the kingdom of God in your heart as the first priority. Don't let the world trick you 
to flip those boxes because the Bible and the secular research all agree that if you flip the boxes, it won't work out. Let's put it the way God has it. Let's seek God first. Let's seek first the kingdom of heaven.